Hello and welcome to the Sandeep Roy show on Express Audio. The Sandeep Roy show. Antarctica. What do you think of when you hear that word? Ice, snow, penguins, or melting ice caps, plummeting emperor penguin populations? or Robert Scott's ill-fated expedition where he died. We don't always think of India when it comes to Antarctica, though once India was joined to Antarctica when it was all part of Gondwana land. In the 1980s, India too set up its first bases in Antarctica, and one of the early missions there included Dr. Shudipta Sengupta, the first Indian woman to set foot there. Dr. Sengupta has not just been to the Antarctic but also to the Arctic and to the top of Himalayan peaks as one of the early women geologists she has been breaking many glass ceilings along the way appropriately her memoir is called breaking rocks and barriers i met her at her home in kolkata shudip sashin gupta welcome to the show thank you very much Let's go back to 27 December 1983. You wake up and you realize your ship has just moored in Antarctica and you're the first Indian woman scientist going there. Take us through that moment when you run down the ladder of the ship and touch Antarctica for the first time. What did it feel like? Actually it was almost like landing on the moon because you know those days we were not exposed to so many shows on antarctica on uh, tv like today we didn't have discovery channel we didn't have national geographic i mean i have read books about antarctica i know it's covered by ice but to see that visually that there is a huge expanse of uh, ice field white ice field dazzling and uh, the weather was very good so the sky was deep blue and there's no color just this white and blue and there are some penguins which are coming towards the ship everything was like a dream i mean dream life as if we have landed in somewhere out of this world so it was truly mesmerizing coming from a place like india was the lack of color kind of disorienting Yes it was because you have to depend on compass to know which is the direction there is no landmark in that sense but you get used to that fortunately we walked in the hills on the land not on the ice shelf where the engineers worked for, to build the station so we were on the hills and situation was far better because there are undulations i mean different things on the hills so you know which side is east which side is west on the ice shelf it was very difficult you know when you speak about east and west one of the things that's fascinating is the sun you say does not rise from the east there and also in the summer it doesn't set at all so what is that like in the summer i mean the height of the summer the strength of the sunlight is same the sun moves around the horizon almost at the same height say around 40 degree height and then i mean it was in the eastern sky in the morning and then traveled all over the horizon to different uh, direction and goes to the west and then again travel back to the east like that but uh, unless you are very sure which is east which is west there's no sense of time when we were going to sleep it was the same daylight and midnight we got up i thought it was quite late in the morning but it was 2 o'clock in the morning that sort of thing so you can't have a feeling of the what time of the day it is so that means since the sun sort of sets and then rises immediately then there's times when the sun and the moon are both in the sky because the sun is so strong it is difficult to see the moon 
in the end of january when the sun sets so called night begins the sun goes under the horizon and then rises up again so that time early morning and that time there will be a dust like situation it was not exactly dark but dust like situation and you can see the moon in on the other horizon if the moon is big enough then it was really a, uh, excellent uh, feeling you've been on the other end of the earth too when you were seeing the northern lights you know you were up in scandinavia how different does that feel in antarctica actually i was on the arctic circle in the summer months a same in the antarctica in summer months so i did not see exactly what is called the northern lights that is only can be seen in uh, winter nights so i did not see northern lights only one day in antarctica i have seen something just for a few seconds i saw a green curtain that was just a little bit of uh, example of northern lights but in arctic also it was the same that it was all day in summer it's all the time it's daylight and same in antarctic all the time in daylight but arctic is very civilized i mean you have got towns cities cars so it's no way that way you can compare arctic and antarctic and uh, in antarctic is the only place like the southern hemisphere there is only place where you would see penguins were they curious about the humans or had by then they had gotten used to it Yes you know the more common penguins are adelie penguins they are very curious if you don't make sudden movements you just sit there they can come very close to you i have a picture when somebody was taking a photograph with a camera and a penguin came and tried to see through the lens of the camera what is happening and they come very close to you but if you made certain movements or try to catch them then they will glide away otherwise they can come very close but adelies are like that but emperor the larger penguins which we did not see much we mostly see adelies but they are very heavy so they can't move very fast and they are a little royal in their behavior they don't come close to you what was your actual mission there as a geologist as a whole team the actual mission was to set up the research station and as a geologist we have the mission to map that shimaka hills that little oasis mountain range means to mark out which rock appears where what is their orientation how they are appearing if there are any shear zone if there are any sets of fold or fault like that and the area where you were in that was not the part of antarctica that is supposed to have been once connected to india when everything was part of gondwana land yes it was part of gondwana land but the area where dakshin gangotri was there and where we work shimakar hills that was actually adjacent to africa on the mozambique side of africa now we have a station in uh, which is called bharati that is situated in a area lashman hill area that was adjacent to india once the initial excitement of touching antarctica and uh, watching the adelie penguins run around has worn off and you start working there what was the hardest and you've worked in so many different terrains but in antarctica what was the hardest thing to get used to or in terms of working i would say the blizzard because i'm used to cold so as it is i mean it's very very annoying because all the time your nose is running and then uh, when it's uh, come out then it freezes so you are rubbing your nose so you that part becomes very sore and then you have to write something on your notebook or take measurements you have to take out your hands from the gloves and then hand gets frozen so it is annoying but the difficult part is when the blizzard blows because it's very frequent in february and it may take another 2 hours to reach your tent back so for those 2 hours if the wind is behind you it try to push you down if it's uh, in front of you then it try to push you back and then the you know 
fine grains of ice crystals like sand crystals it blows on your face so which is very painful so that part is the most difficult i think walking through blizzards and it sounds like it would be also really scary because there are several incidents where you're trapped in a blizzard and uh, you know it will end at some point but you don't know whether it will end soon enough for you to for example get to your ship or wherever you're going yes it can last for few hours or it can last for few days so i mean especially in february towards the late february it may last longer so it's very uncertain i mean it can just go on for seven days like i mean scott and his friends died for that long blizzard so you never know how long it will last yeah i was thinking reading that that all of us have grown up with these stories of the expedition of scott and uh, in them dying or roald amundsen and the race for the south pole so we read them as stories of adventure perhaps and uh, you know we know tragedy can happen scott dies but knowing all that once you're there did you have a renewed appreciation or insight into what it must have been in that time for somebody like scott and his team to get out in and try to go to this unmapped region of the world called the south pole oh yes every every second of it because when you enter the Antarc- inter- antarctic region through the pack ice then you have the help of satellite these days you have the help of a very well built icebreaker ship so imagining that 100 years ago people went there without the help of satellite with wooden ships plus when you are on the land and then with uh, that kind of primitive equipment primitive clothing so it must be terrible in that time but look at them i mean they are unbelievable each and every story is unbelievable and the other thing i mean it sounds a little like we're being facetious or funny here are uh, the things we don't think about is when you're working out in the field is challenging enough everywhere especially as a woman i would imagine but in antarctica where it's all flat and everything you write quite amusingly in the book that it poses additional challenges like if you have to pee or answer nature's call then it becomes an even trickier especially in the blizzard to go out in the tent to answer nature's call is most irritating most irritating things and at least in uh, shimakar hills i had the cover of uh, hillside you know and even rocks and all that but when i was uh, staying in the ice shelf there is no such cover it's all flat and the visibility is very clear anyone can see miles so to go oh, i mean they have made walls in the base camp so you can go behind the ice wall but that was very irritating especially through the blizzard when at least 30 40 people are working around so you have to be very careful but everybody was polite and helpful so no embarrassing situation happened how many other women were there uh, we were two me and aditi but aditi is a marine biologist so she st- mostly stayed in the ship her work was in the ship so i was in the field so i was out in the land or I, on the ice shelf so aditi had an actual bathroom oh yeah yeah i mean her life was much uh, easier but at the same time she used to come and stay a day with us to have a test of the life real life in antarctica and you went there not once but twice did it feel different had anything changed yes it was different because i lacked that initial enthusiasm because i knew what was to expect but even then there are certain more difficult situation like that that happened especially we had that fatal accident i lost four of my colleagues that was uh, very very painful and that was different but more or less it was same i didn't have sudden you know new things to expect 
people who read the book will discover the fatal accident you're talking about where four team members died tragically in an accident uh, because of carbon monoxide poisoning but now when we read news about antarctica the change seems so visible there you mentioned emperor penguins and i was reading a news report about how emperor penguin colonies are plummeting now as the sea ice diminishes how are you watching and reading the news about antarctica now I feel very sorry because I can't imagine that the pack ice are really diminishing. Actually, that is creating a lot of problem. And if the pack ice are not formed, the sunrise are absorbed in the dark sea. So that warm sea will melt the ice shelf. The ice shelf will break down. So all, all together, it will be a very, very dangerous situation for Antarctic ice. The scientist... said this will happen but they thought it will happen in 100 years now it is happening in 30 years so it's really a frightening situation you said one of the things you didn't expect was that the ice pack would be melting at the rate that it is and uh, we're reading reports about it you know scientists have definitely been sounding the alarm but this is not a problem that i can solve by not using plastic bags or whatever small you know this will require sort of global effort are you seeing any signs of that you know and is india part of that not really not really because you have to take into account everything not only using plastic then not cutting the forests not expanding these roads in the himalayas or anywhere but there's hardly any effort there uh, still dams are being built roads are being built they are widened to four lane roads and himalaya is full of traffic actually no one cares really the government doesn't care the scientists are shouting but the public doesn't care that much so it's not happening nothing happening really what do you think it will take like for sea levels to rise enough that a coastal city will get submerged and then people will wake up by then it'll probably be too late no it will be too late it will be too late because uh, it's happening happening every day every year every month and the sea level is rising and then suddenly it will rise so high that all the coastal cities will be submerged and it will be almost uh, no point of no return so i don't know i really uh, i'm scared about those the most amazing thing for me was not the idea of you going to antarctica but the fact that when you broached this idea to your family your mother said why not and this is very unusual in a bengali mother i speak from experience were you aware that your parents were clearly unusual no actually i was not aware that time i am aware more now because that time you think some of the parents are like that i did realize that they are so rare that that kind of support is not easy to get and my parents my mother i think is very adventurous in her mind so she also get excited for any adventure and my father was always wanted us to study well and as long as you are doing your work you study then you can do whatever you feel like so he was also very very different than others we appreciate that now more than we did that time i know you chose not to marry but uh, your sister did actually they would have been happier my, especially my mother would have been happier if you got married but my eldest sister and me did not and my middle sister did she all the time says that even you can get married and do whatever you feel like doing so we always laughed and he say okay get us someone who will allow us to do whatever we want to do and like that i think inside she was a little bit sad that we did not got married but she didn't make a big fuss about it what about relatives uh maybe at the beginning yes but later on they also got used to <laughs> because i mean there are people in the family i mean women in the family who did not got get married i have a aunt who who was a teacher and who looked after her family and did not get married so there are examples before us also 
And this might sound very sexist, but it's a reality in our lives here. And you mention it in the book also, which is why I'm asking you, this. especially given the profession you chose, geologist, you're out in the field all the time. You're not a lab scientist like that. Did you also initially face all these things about, my God, she'll be out in the sun, she'll come back really dark. And, you know, then what's going to happen, which you hear even now all the time. Oh, yes, all the time. All the time when I came back from mountaineering or field work, there will be neighbors, relatives, oh, look at you, you have become just look like a charcoal. <laughs> Why did you got so sunburnt? Couldn't you use some cream or any that kind of remarks are always there. And I believe it's always there now also. Did, so Did it affect you as a young person? Oh, maybe, suppose I had a marriage ceremony to attend. Then I was think, oh my God, yes, I wish I were not talking that much. Like that, I mean, not seriously, but sometimes yes, yes. But the other thing that's interesting is that at that time when you were studying here, you chose to study science, where a lot of women go for the arts. Why did you choose it? Actually, I think my father is the main influence in that because he wanted us to be scientists. From the very beginning, he taught us in such a way that we knew we have to study science. So my eldest sister studied science. My middle sister said, no, I don't like science. I would not study. So she chose humanities. And me also, I thought, yes, my, like my father, I will study physics. But then I changed to geology. Well, that's also an interesting story. And I want you to tell that about why and how you changed to geology, because geology is not a subject we grow up uh, reading much about in school. And in fact, I think a lot of people think geology is some kind of cousin of geography. Yes, I also didn't know much about geology. But at the interview, that professor told me that, like, uh, what do you want to do? What is your hobby? So I said, traveling. I like to travel. So he said, then you should study geology because you can travel all your life. As a student, you can travel. As a professional, you can travel and you always get good jobs. After passing out, you get good jobs and you will travel all your life. So that appealed to me. I didn't know much about geology really that time. Very few people knew because they confused geology with geography or zoology or something like that. And when you came back and told your family that, oh, I decided not to study f physics but enroll in geology. How did they react? My father was very upset. My father was really upset and I felt very bad for him. Then I sort of regretted. But then I already told the principal that I will not come back to physics. So I couldn't go back to physics and go back to him and tell that, no, I will study physics. So I begged my father that, okay, let me study just for one year. If I don't like it, and if I can't make it, then I'll come back to physics. So, I mean, he reluctantly, he had to agree. But then when I did well in the exam and got first, so he also did not press much. And I liked the subject. Well, you came first. You were, there were only, I think you've written six girls in your class. Only two. Two girls. Two girls, yes. And uh, how many boys? About 20. And you came first. Did the boys resent that? Perhaps they did, I don't know. <laughs> but in the class, I was uh, a little ahead. I never bunked class. I was a very serious student. The professors liked me. So altogether, they were not very surprised also. So really, I didn't face that kind of... Uh, you know, criticism or uh, envy. No, I did not. What about when you were out in the field? What was most challenging? Because I assume people had not really seen a female geologist out in the field. Yeah, as a student, you are in a group. So first year was not bad because you go out in a group all the time. From postgraduate, you are divided in smaller groups like four of you. So that was also not bad. Only when, when you are doing your thesis work, then you have to go alone. So uh, me and my friend, my female friend, classmate, we chose adjacent area. So we used 
try to use most of the time go out together. So we covered both areas together. It will be easier for us. But after that, when I did my PhD, I have to go out alone uh, with a little uh, tribal boy. So that was a little tough. But anyway, I managed it. Did you ever feel unsafe? Not really. No, never. When I did my field work, I never felt unsafe because that tribal boy was there. He knew more or less all the area. And, you know, it was not unsafe like these days. By later days, when I went back after 10 years, then there were a lot of um, proper roads and a lot of traffic, motorcycle, zooming around. That time it was little unsafe. But when I did my field work, I never felt unsafe. And at that time, it was a little unsafe, not because there was traffic and you could get run over, but you say you're working there as a lone woman and uh, people in motorcycles would zoom by and pass comments and things. Yes, yes. They will just stop when they say there is a, on a hillock, there's a girl doing something. They will stop, come and see what I'm doing and then watch it for hours. They will not move from there. And then if there are more than one or two, three boys, they will pass remarks between themselves. So it was very uh, uncomfortable. And usually my porter or my driver, when I was in GSI doing field work, my driver, he would come into my safety and he would also sit next to me to see that nothing untoward. But altogether it was, I mean, nothing really happened, but it was very irritating situation. But the other thing that's also rather heartwarming to read is that even though people had never seen somebody like you out in the field before, it also exposed to you a kind of genuine warmth and kindness in sort of rural India and the tribal belts where you were working that perhaps we have forgotten in the city. Sometimes, you know, you go to a tribal village they all laugh at you because of your hat and uh, trouser and all that. But at the same time, they offer you a glass of water in a very shining brass glass and um, ask you to sit and rest if you need that. And then keep on asking, what are you doing? Why? I mean, it's simple answer is always, they are all curious, there, will there be mining? So I always used to say, no, no, no mining, it's just teaching, I'm studying, that kind of thing. When you speak about mining, I mean, that, I guess, even if it was not in your case, since you were doing academic research, I mean, I, how do geologists or scientists deal with the ethics of that, where, you know, as part of your work, you can find that mineral deposit or oil or something, which the country wants, the governments want, maybe many of the people there also want because it will become development. But you know that this discovery will change everything in that landscape forever and not necessarily for the better. Oh, yes, very much. It's a kind of a dilemma for any geologist because at one point they want to discover something which will be workable. At the other point, they know that if it's discovered, then it's going to spoil everything. So really, it's a dilemma for them. I think some of them may not worry too much about this possible destruction, but most of them, most of the geologists suffer for this kind of uh, situation. And this is not something you ever had to face in your work? Not really. Except for a few months in Sweden, I worked for Swedish a geological survey. We were looking for minerals, but most of the time I study for academic research reason. <laughs> but yeah, you were studying rocks, and uh, did you ever wish that you'd chosen an easier profession, especially while doing field work and you had to lug back a rock sack full of rocks? I mean, botanists bring back lots of leaves, maybe. You have to bring back rocks. How heavy could a, did a rock sack get? Oh, yes, very much. Especially, you know, in India, you have a porter with you. You can always afford to have a porter. But in Antarctica or in Europe, where I did field work on my own, you have to carry yourself. When you have to come back with a heavy rucksack, you always curse yourself, why did I choose this profession? 
But anyway, that's too late. You said also when you started studying geology, which you did impulsively, you enjoyed it. And then you go out into the field and despite the heavy rocks in your rucksack, you are enjoying it. What was your favorite part of geology? I mean, field work altogether. Field work altogether always is favorite part because it exposes you to different uh, interesting situation. Then it's really fun to explain what if, if there is a complex outcrop pattern, then it's uh, you are thinking why it happened. So you keep on like a detective to looking for the clue. Uh, so it's very interesting. You also like detective stories, don't you? Oh, yes, very much. <laughs> yes. And especially my supervisor, Professor Shubir Ghosh, I used to like Sherlock Holmes, Agatha Christie and those common. And then he introduced me to Nero Ulf and Megre and other detective stories also. So, yeah, I also got hooked up. You go to interesting parts of the world, you meet interesting people. One of the people you ended up meeting actually a couple of times, I think, because of your work is, for example, Indira Gandhi. What was that like? What did she want to know from you? I met her three times. Once we were in mountaineering and we are not allowed the permission to climb. That time she only asked us to uh, meet the secretary and explain to him the problem. So that time it was not much interaction. Second time I met her when we were in uh, GSI pavilion at the Asia 72 International Trade Fair and I was standing there in behind uh, Allosaurus, a Dinosaurus. So she asked some relevant questions about geology and this dinosaurs and all that. And then later, when after returning from Antarctica, she invited us for tea. At that time at uh, Science Bigan Bhavan, more than an hour, I think. That time she was very different, very happy mood and uh, asking us questions, how did you deal with the cold and how she dealt with uh, freezing cold in Switzerland when she stayed in Switzerland and that kind of... She was in a very different and very happy mood that time. You say the first time you met her was when you were trying to get permission for mountaineering. So let's talk a bit about mountaineering. You're not just a geologist, you're also a mountaineer. How did you get into mountaineering? Actually, when I was, I was studying my graduation, BSc, then there was a rock climbing camp. And one of my friend's uncle was organizer of the camp. So she said that if you go, then I'll go. And I convinced my mother. So she said, okay, if she is going, you can go. And in that camp, I did very well. All the techniques and all that. And there were local mountaineers like Omulya Shian, Manik Banerjee, and Pranesh Chakraborty, local mountaineers who were seniors who taught us, plus some HMI instructors. So I did very well in rock climbing and all that. So they suggested I must try for the real t mountaineering training at the Himalayan Mountaineering Institute. So I applied for that and got a scholarship and did that training basic. Then I liked it so much, so I did advance. Then expeditions came one after another. Like that, it happened. And the HMI at that time is Tenzing Norge. Yeah, yeah. He was our chief instructor in and charge. First, he was a little aloof because he was higher in rank. But when we went to the hills for actual training, then he used to come every day and correct our position and check our training. So that time he was very friendly and with us, talked a lot with us. And you were part of an all-woman expedition that tackled a peak that no one had climbed. In retrospect, what felt more exciting, touching Antarctica or being top of Lalana Peak? I think Antarctica. Because uh, mountaineering is almost known to us. We all read stories and uh, then I did my training. So I knew what to expect. But Antarctica was more unknown and I was more impressed by that scenery which is not known to me. So I think Antarctica was more exciting. But the peak, uh, tell us where that peak was and also 
what was the feeling of having actually made it to the top of a peak that no expedition had because it also meant i assume that parts of it were unmapped in a way say everest is not you know the first feeling is relief finally we got it because the route was so tough that we made it is kind of relief and then of course happy that we made it so i suppose happiness became then it was a real excitement happiness and realization that we were the first one to reach there and all this followed but first one is finally oh they are we finally reach we don't have to climb any farther so that kind of relief is there you say the mountaineering is known to us but climbing something like lalana peak were there things that you didn't expect or you didn't think would be as challenging as they proved to be that the glacier will have so much crevasses we knew it will be tough but um, from one our camp 2 to camp 3 was almost full of glacier there was not a wide space where we actually put our tent in that kind of thing so that was unexpected and that was very challenging and we felt anything can happen at any moment so we knew why you know before our expedition one british mountaineer robert pettigrew we shujadi our leader wrote to him and he answered that it's a very tough region so don't kill five maidens of in india so it was almost became prophetic that we came back but uh, we lost to our two colleagues and these were unfortunately the colleagues who were made it to the top with you right but i don't think you did another mountaineering trip after that was that the reason yeah i think so because you know when you lose your so some close friends like that in an accident and that so easy can happen to anyone it's so shocking because you see the effect on their families and then you feel that it's not worth it it's not worth going taking that much risk that can take your life accidents are in the mountains are at least 50% of this due to overconfidence and that is very difficult to control you think you will be able to do that you don't have the actual realization of the practical situation even now i see so many deaths in the mountains due to overconfidence and especially these days did you see that queue to reach the everest and to be there for hours in that height is taking a huge risk for someone who is not physically fit so altogether i think it's very unnecessary risk somehow i mean i don't mind going for uh, trekking and that kind of but serious mountaineering i feel a little bit uh, too much risk to take so often just in normal language when we are talking about mountaineering we say edmund hillary and norge conquered everest you know we use this word conquered and we don't think about it at all it cannot but breed over confidence if in your head you are thinking about conquering something no i don't like the word conquer because you can't conquer nature you lucky that you went there but if the nature was against you you could be perished so you can't conquer nature only thing that you yes you were able to reach certain height what you aimed for that's all but conquering is not possible you can't conquer nature but you can certainly devastate nature which is you know you mentioned this when you talked about the overdevelopment that's happening in the mountains and things like that forests being cut down every year we hear about more and more devastating landslides and then we rebuild all over again more instead of less when you the trees are not there holding it do you think we can turn back the clock i mean you have to be very serious about it to turn back the clock because we have went too far i mean it's just over development of uh, this mountain region is horrible horrible every day you can see the result now and it will be worse and worse and worse because everything is against us if we put too many dams you see the result 
if you concretized a whole slope of the mountain you see the result that's happening in irrespective of all the accidents all the landslide everything is still going on so it's almost point of no return and i can't let ourselves off the hook it's easy to sometimes say they are doing this over there they are building the dams government is doing this but we even ordinary people sitting here you know when we want to we want to go up to the hills but we want a nice resort we want nice roads we, if you can build a highway that will take you there in 3 hours instead of 6 you want that and when a landslide washes that away then you are angry with the government and say come on rebuild that so i can get back to my resort so you know even ordinary people have bought into this idea that the mountain exists for them exactly that's the problem that's a problem that's why they are building resorts they are building five star building five star hotels all with all kind of comforts which what you get in the uh, cities so that's a problem the people want them and people are paying them so the resort people are covering all the mountain slopes everywhere uh, that's why i said point of no return because they are doing it for their own profit we are doing it oh it's so easy just to go dr- drive around and stay in a resort and look at the mountains sitting in a air conditioned room or air heated room so that kind of things we are not ready to rough up we are all the comforts over there so it will happen and it's happening on to a little more optimistic thing I, at the end of your book you write you know when you your first you wrote a ver- an autobiography in bangla that had come out after it was serialized in the magazine desh and you wrote that many women wrote to you after your book came out and you know saying uh, that it inspired them but while you were fortunate to have done all these things and achieved all this what struck me is that you actually went looking for it you applied for that scholarship in london that took you there then you applied for the position in sweden and went and worked there you applied for the antarctica trip you applied for things which people said very low chance of you getting it they'll only select one person and uh, i think that's unusual because so many of us especially women are taught to wait for things to come to them instead of going out and saying let me give it a shot yeah i think i am a little bit too optimistic and then i did just take a chance i mean i knew i may not get it I knew I, I may not be chosen but why not take a chance so I most of the time I did apply like that that I mean I may not get it but why not take a chance so it's applied for the same that scholarship applied for my going to Antarctica like that and I was lucky that I got the chances so most of the time people are not lucky but somehow I was lucky to get the chances but did you have male colleagues who said oh she's getting the chance you know they who ignored your scholarship and said oh she's getting a chance because she's a woman and you know they want diversity or whatever oh yeah all the time <laughs> because they'll say oh the professors like you because you are a woman i mean it's common for male colleagues to talk like that but i ignored them it, they have their opinion i i know what i am doing now there are a lot of women in the sciences including your field geology and you yourself won the shanti swarup bhatnagar prize i think 1991 and last year that prize was again in the news but for the wrong reasons which was that there were 12 prize winners all of them men so what do you think is the issue here even from 1991 to 2023 that's a long time and uh, why more things change the less more they stay the same yeah i'm really surprised because i mean more in physics there are uh, women now some of the science subject have less naturally in shanti shihadu bhatnagar award is for science subject so but women usually choose biological sciences so there are a number of women recipients in physics there were less but now it is there are some but medical sciences also there are some but somehow in geological sciences uh, there are very few 
Yes, in GSI there are a lot of women, but in uh, academics the number of women are less. So research work are really done by the academics. So that's why maybe there's still no women from the art science group got that Bhatnagar award. Actually, no women from any science group got the Bhatnagar award last year. It was all male. Yeah, that also happened. So the, what does that say about, you know, what do you think? You're there, you were there, you kind of set an example, it inspires people to a certain extent, but you're only one person. What do you think would help have more people get over this mental block that, say, I feel like geology is not meant for women? For Because all the reasons that were given to you when you started still hold true, Right. You're out in the field all the time, marriage, all of those issues come are still factors. Actually, I think uh, because I did not get married, I have more time for research and uh, more time to devote on my profession. Most of the cases, if someone gets, the, it's the case of women, they get married and the main responsibility of looking after children is on them. So their research time academically they lag behind their colleagues, main colleagues. They have to devote quite a lot of time to their families, to their children. And you can't expect everyone not to get married and not to devote all their time on the academics. So that's a compromise. It happens. I'm curious, did you face issues where, say, you're with male colleagues and uh, they just assume because you're a woman that certain things are your job like, oh, oh, making tea or making food in the camp or something like that would automatically fall on you? Yes, sometimes. In Antarctica itself it happened because, you know, I can't play bridge. And uh, sometimes in that camp when we were uh, six or seven of us, those who can play bridge, they used to start playing bridge and I still am not an interested. I used to wash all the utensils for one or two days I did without telling anyone. Then on the third day when I say they just left the, their plates for me to wash, then I revolted. I said, no way, you wash your own plate, you do, finish all your job, then you go and play bridge as much as you like. So they say, sorry, sorry, sorry. They were nice, but they did it unconsciously that, oh, there's a woman, she will cook and she will take over all this job. Well, I want to end by uh, on a completely different note by asking you, you know, you, you say in the book you studied Robindo Shungit with the famous singer Shuchi Tramitro. And uh, they say there's a Robindo Shungit for every occasion. If you're out in Antarctica in the field all by yourself in that snow at night looking at the sky, what Robindo Shungit would come to your mind? I mean... Of course, that the first one is Akash Bhara Shudjotara. Then there are so many. I mean, uh, right now I can't think, but I was very surprised when I wrote a book uh, on Antarctic expedition, first my Bengali book. For every chapter, I gave a few quotations. And I wanted to have a quotation by Tagore on the first chapter. And I was surprised. He has written a poem as if he has been there. It was, now I don't recall the lines, but it was so apt for Antarctica, that poem. That was not a song, but that is a poem. Unbelievable. That he almost described the whole situation there. Akash Parashujitar, of course, works even for the mountains because it is about a sky filled with stars and sun. And I know you've complained your voice is bad. Do you want to sing one line? Oh, no, thank you very much. <laughs> now, with my hoarse voice, I can't sing anymore. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, finally, Shudipta Sengupta, what is keeping you busy now? Actually, I'm not busy. These days, I'm just relaxing. I read books, I watch movies, I read newspapers, which are very depressing these days, like that. And sometimes give lectures, that's all. Shudipta Sengupta, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Dr. Shudipta Sengupta is the author of Breaking Rocks and Barriers, Memoirs of a Geologist and Mountaineer. 
We spoke to her at her home in Kolkata. Find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at Express Podcasts. This show was produced by Shashank Bhargav and edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. Thanks for listening. This is Sandeep Roy on Express Audio.